really delighted to be here and think with you about how the social sciences, and in particular my discipline of psychological science, meets and connects with Christian faith. It's actually a topic of great interest, psychology and religion. I did a little search of Google Books and you can see that the phrase psychology and religion has occurred as in an increasing proportion of printed English words over the last couple of centuries. I did a psych info search of all the psychological literature for the words religion, religious, religiosity, and look at how that has grown uh, just over the last 30 years. Uh, the British Psychological Society dedicated a special issue of its magazine to psychology, religion, and spirituality. What's going on? What's all this scholarship about? I see seven different ways in which people who are interested in religion and people who are interested in psychological science have brought them together. First, several are not on this evening's menu. Uh, the first being uh, an exploration of how faith might guide people's exploration of different topics or the practice that they uh, adhere to as mental health workers. Secondly, there's efforts to apply psychological science in practical ways to faith communities. For example, as a social psychologist, I'm interested in how people might construct memorable, persuasive messages that are effective. Or thirdly, there are certain special topics like religion and prejudice or the psychology of prayer, or I've written recently about uh, issues related to sexual orientation and marriage. Uh, those are all good things to talk about, and I'd be happy to engage any of those in question and answer afterwards or at the reception. What I do want to talk to you first briefly about are what I would call the hors d'oeuvres uh, on the menu this evening. Brief little snippets. First of all, offering you some thoughts on how faith not only allows, but in fact empowers and <coughs> motivates scientific inquiry and skeptical scrutiny in very much the way that we heard articulated here a few moments ago, where it was stated that the mission of this institution is to marry scholarship, freedom, and faith. I think that's a happy marriage. Secondly, I want to think briefly with you about how certain big ideas in psychological science about human nature connect with and relate to corresponding big ideas that emerge from biblical and theological scholarship. What are those two bodies of insight into human nature have to say to each other. Thirdly, I want to offer you just a few uh, quick thoughts on, the, on what we're doing when we study the psychology of religion, for example. If a psychology of religion is completely successful in explaining religion, does it debunk religion? And finally, I want to offer you the main course, which is a particular question that I've been fascinated by, and I think I hope that you'll be fascinated by as well before this evening's done. Is religion associated more with harm or good, with human flourishing or with human degradation? There's a big argument that's been going on in the culture, and particularly in intellectual culture, over the last few years about that, and we've got some really striking data to show you. Okay, that's the plan for this evening. The first hors d'oeuvre has to do with just some reflections about the connections of science, reason, and faith, which is spoken of earlier um, just a few moments ago. The religious mandate for science goes something like this. If you're a theist, you believe two things if you believe anything. Number one, you believe that there is a God. And number two, you believe that it's not you. Uh, and it's not me. And in fact, Knowing that there is a God, but it's not us, is the very basis for our humility. We should, therefore, hold our own untested beliefs tentatively. We're not God. The surest conviction I can hold is that some of what I believe is in error. And that's the ground of a spirit of humility and openness to inquiry. It should also empower us to assess others' ideas with open-minded skepticism. If somebody says something dogmatically and authoritatively, that's not reason to believe it. They're not God, they're human beings, just like you. And therefore, when appropriate, to use observation and experimentation to winnow truth from error. I say when appropriate, because not every significant question lends itself to empirical inquiry, but some do, such as ones we'll be looking at this evening. 
And indeed, we see some biblical warrant for this. Moses, if a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and what he says does not come true, then it's not the Lord's message. That's a straightforward kind of empiricism. Jeremiah, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Or my favorite, St. Paul, test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Uh, my own religious heritage, I grew, having grown up in the Presbyterian Church, now part of the Reformed Church in America, has historically called itself Reformed and ever reforming. And it embraces this idea, this humility of spirit, at least in theory, that we are not God, and thus we must continually be worshiping God with our minds as well as our hearts, and open to new understandings and new inquiry. Uh, okay, that's the first hors d'oeuvre, just kind of a basic framework from which I operate. Second, I said I thought it might be interesting just very quickly to see, to look at some big ideas that have emerged from psychological science and from biblical and theological scholarship which jointly pertain to human nature. And it seems to me there are some powerful complementary principles. For example, in social psychology, which happens to be my own field, we have a rather large literature over the last 30 years on the interplay between attitudes and behavior. We have long known and understood that attitudes can influence behavior, and thus persuasion attempts to change attitudes in order to modify behavior. But more recently, we have massive evidence that it works the other way around, too. Attitudes follow behavior, and thus, if you could coax, if, but not coerce, somebody to engage in some new behavior, giving witness to something, for example, standing up to be countered or whatever, their attitudes may become stronger in support of how they're acting. Now, I uh, know that as a social psychologist, and I was hearing uh, somebody who's theologically literate, former colleague of mine, articulate the corresponding interplay between faith, which leads to action, think of Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road, for example, but also the corresponding uh, mirror image axiom that faith grows out of obedient action. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example, in The Cost of Discipleship, writes extensively about how the way to have faith is to act as if you have faith, knowing that, that will strengthen your faith in the process. It's the same idea, just expressed in different words. Or think about the relationship between brain and mind. In psychological science, particularly contemporary, contemporary what's called cognitive neuroscience, we have lots of evidence about how brain manifests mind. Everything psychological is ultimately biological, and we have um, thousands of brain imaging studies that are helping us understand and unpack that. From the theological literature, we have the corresponding idea that we are bodies alive. We are not, we are not just disembodied immortal souls. We are nefesh. We are animated bodies. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day, their thoughts perish. Our very existence is dependent, as we understand it, is dependent on body. Thus, death, the great enemy, is real. And the hope of life after death is not intrinsic to our nature, but is a gift of God. The Easter hope is what we hope God will give us, the resurrection hope. That's what's articulated in the Apostles' Creed. But at the same time, in psychological science, we have a whole field of psychosomatic medicine and various other literatures that illustrate how our cognition, how our thoughts, how our emotions affect our body, how our expectations and our interpretations of events affect us physiologically, our stress reactions and so forth. And likewise, we have in the theological literature at least a sort of correlated idea that we are more than bodies. We are also created for spiritual relationship. We are spiritual beings at the same time. My third parallel is more striking and really sharper, and that is the connection between the contemporary social psychological idea of self-serving bias and the historic theological idea of pride. The social psychologists of the last couple decades have told us in so many ways that self-serving bias, the tendency to perceive and present oneself favorably, is powerful and it's often perilous. Uh, because we tend to think we're better than average. When in conflict, we tend to think we're the good guys. Uh, 
And that gets us into a lot of problems. Indeed, it gets us into a lot of problems. Pride is historically, in theological literature, the deadliest of the seven deadly sins. It's the fundamental sin, the one that goes before all the others. And yet, in psychological science, we also understand that positive self-esteem and positive thinking pays dividends. And so there's benefits to positive thinking and not to being, as opposed to depressive, negative thinking about oneself. And in the theological literature, we have the idea that to experience grace, God's unconditional acceptance, enables us to accept ourselves uh, in a way that is healthy and wise. In social psychology, we have uh, a couple kind of complementary literatures that on the one hand emphasize, as does so much of social psychology, that we are the creatures of our social world. Social influence is powerful. Situations control us in ways and pull our strings in ways that we don't necessarily stop to think about in our day-to-day -day existence. And some of psych social psychology's most famous experiments demonstrate that. And yet at the same time, we are the creators as well as the creatures of our social world. If we have an internal locus of control, if we feel empowered, we're more likely, in fact, to be efficacious in our worlds. In the theological literature, we have at least a sort of parallel idea that on the one hand, God is ultimately in control, God is sovereign, as Luther, among others, said, and yet we have responsibility. And that's a kind of paradoxical, uh, a pair of paradoxical uh, affirmations that in some at least uh, sort of way correspond to these uh, uh, social psychological ideas. Finally, in psychological science, we've got a lot of commentary about how amazing are the powers of our cognition. If you just understand what goes on as you're perceiving, seeing, and hearing right now, there's a tremendously complex information processing. We've come to appreciate everything from the cognitive powers of infants to the thinking powers of adults. And at the same time, we appreciate from the theological perspective that we are made in God's own image, little less than the angels. Uh, but to err is human. Uh, there's a massive literature on cognitive illusions. Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in, well, in economics for creating the field of behavioral economics, has a wonderful recent book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's been a bestseller. That's largely about the pitfalls, the natural errors that are built into our thinking tendencies that we need to watch out for. And indeed, not surprisingly, because though we're made in God's image, we're also finite, fallible creatures. So that's uh, affirma a kind of hors d'oeuvre number two, if you will. Just a little kind of quick overview of some of the big ideas that can be distilled from psychological science that line up alongside some big ideas in biblical scholarship and theology. Last hors d'oeuvre is this. Uh, think about this question. If a complete psychological, if, if, if a psychology of religion were completely successful, if an evolutionary explanation combined with a neuroscientific perspective of what's going on in the brain when people are having spiritual experiences, cognitive explanations, social cultural influences in terms of how you've been shaped by your environment, if all things, these things together successfully and completely explain why one person is religious and another person is not, for example, does that explain away the authenticity of their religious faith? Um, well, there is sort of that idea. Uh, the New Scientist, for example, recently had an article on the new neuroscience of religion, uh, and it was about how your brain creates or manufactures this illusory God. Uh, and so the first point I want to make is that uh, explaining a belief, any belief, your political beliefs, your religious beliefs, whatever, explaining a belief does not explain it away. Archbishop William Temple had this idea some years ago when he remarked to somebody in an audience that you believe that I believe what I believe because of the way I was brought up, because of the way you were brought up. <laughs> uh, and in fact, 
one can, if one plays this game, have not only a psychology of religion, but a psychology of irreligion. And in fact, half century and a little more ago, there was published a book, The Psychology of Unbelief. And in fact, there's now a research group at Cambridge University that's investigating atheism. And you can, they have a website that they've established. It's the psychology of atheism, right? Uh, and so we had in, uh, Trends in Cognitive Sciences earlier this year, a book, an article on the origins of religious disbelief. Okay, if this enterprise succeeds and we completely and satisfactorily explain atheism and why some people disbelieve, does that demolish atheism as a credible belief system? Here I rise in defense of atheism. No way, because whether a belief is true or false, whether God exists or not, is a completely separate and independent question for why some people might believe and others not. Let's play this game, just for kind of tongue-in-cheek fun here. Would a successful psychology of irreligion explain it away? Let's have a little go at this. Uh, first of all, let's look at uh, who are the atheists and religious skeptics. And first of all, two things they are is male and pale uh, in terms of their demographics. The skeptical inquirers, uh, pantheon of skeptics, for example, in 2011, included 27 male and zero female. Uh, the Prometheus Books authors, this is a publisher that publishes books that are critical of religion and the paranormal. Uh, I analyzed their 2010 catalog. There were 98 men and four women authors. Uh, the Skeptics Society did a survey of their membership several years ago, and I just happened to notice that the respondents were four and five male. The New York Times commented on an audience at the uh, people gathered for the 2010 Council for S Secular Humanism, noting that it was largely white and male. Imagine a Star Trek convention, but older. <laughs> uh, and if we look at who's irreligious in terms of national demographic statistics, we find uh, it's much more likely to be men than women, and it's uh, in terms of daily prayer as well as worship, and it's more likely to be in the United States, uh, European American than African American, male and pale. Uh, and we can also see this, by the way, if we look at who visits different websites. Uh, Google.com uh, has uh, by one uh, algorithm that estimates the demographics of visitors to various websites, half male and half female visitors. My college has half male and half female visitors. Uh, but now let's pick one that's more gender linked. Good Housekeeping Magazine, which is a women's magazine in the United States, has more than two to one female visitors, while SportsIllustrated.com has more than two to one male visitors. Okay, no surprise there. That's what you'd expect, right? Now let's go to a spirituality site, BeliefNet.com. That's two to one female visitors. That is, at, whereas RichardDawkins.net is two to one male. Uh, Skeptic.com is two to one male, okay? Visitors to spirituality websites are about as female as good housekeeping visitors. Visitors to, Richard, to atheism and skepticism websites are about as male as Sports Illustrated visitors. Uh, so uh, again, what have I just said? Have I just, have, if I continue with this enterprise and succeed, will I have, de if I can explain atheism and skepticism, religious skepticism, will I have debunked it? Again, absolutely not. And for the same reason, if somebody successfully explains your religious belief, that leaves the question of whether your belief is true or not as an entirely separate question for you to consider and ponder on its own merits. Okay, those are the hors d'oeuvres. Ready for the main course? Uh, the main course asks the question, does religion do more harm or good? And it's a big question. The Economist magazine, not long back, uh, made it a debate, resolved. This house believes that religion is a force for good. Uh, others say, notably the new atheists, that it's a force for harm. Richard Dawkins, faith is one of the world's great evils. Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, religion is violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism and tribalism, bigotry invested in ignorance, hostile to free inquiry, contemptuous of women, and coercive towards children. Bad news. Sam Harris says it more simply. Religion, all religion, is two things. Number one, it's false. And number two, it's dangerous. It's toxic. 
Now the question of truth or falsity, I leave to Bill and the th your theological colleagues in the philosophy of religion. However, the question of whether it's toxic or whether it's associated with human flourishing is a straightforward empirical social science question. Let's have at it. What do the data show? Um, by the way, Psychological Bulletin last October uh, had an article, does religious belief promote pro-sociality? That would be altruism, generosity, and forth, so forth, a critical examination. And the argument is, the answer to this question by this reviewer was no, it doesn't. It's, if anything, it's toxic. Uh, I was a respondent to that, and by the way, at the upcoming uh, Association for Psychological Science uh, meeting, we're going to be on a panel together uh, extending this uh, kind of friendly debate a little more. So, is religion toxic, or does it enhance human flourishing? Well, we can start just with historical examples. And if you read books on this subject, you'll find that they'll just be piling up examples on one or the other. And these are significant examples. They're not trivial examples. So, for example, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the Bible-banging KKKers down in the United States, the gay-bashing religious right, they've all given religion a bad name. But then religion's defenders respond by noting that the anti-slavery movement the, uh, was religiously inspired. Faith, people of faith were the ones who founded hospitals, orphanages, hospices, universities around the world. Give me a break. But, say religion's attackers, look at who sent off the bomb in Boston, you know, a couple weeks ago. Look at who, did, who, who, uh, who uh, perpetrated 9-11. Look at what the Taliban is reaping in Afghanistan. Religion is toxic. But, say religion's defenders, look at atheism. Tens of millions of people died under the, at the hands of dictators who had no belief in God and no idea that human beings are the children of God. So these extremes remind us, first of all, that religion comes in varied forms with varied effects. Sometimes very good and sometimes very, very bad. But what about everyday folks? here in Alberta, or down in the United States, or in other countries. Uh, let me show you some data. First, about the associations between religious engagement and human self-reported happiness. Uh, by the way, we have a couple contrasting hypotheses here as to what we're going to define. Sigmund Freud said that religion is a sickness. It's an obsessional neurosis that leads people to live sexually repressed, uptight, and therefore unhappy lives. Christopher Hitchens echoed Freud, religion does not make its adherents happy. Richard Dawkins helped sponsor uh, uh, advertising that was on the side of British uh, buses for some months. Big sign, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. You'll be happier if you give up the God idea. On the other side, we have people such as C.S. Lewis and others who've said that the life of faith is marked by shalom, joy, inner peace, well-being. Who's right? Well, we have lots of data. Some of it goes back to the Gallup organization, uh, which while George Gallup Jr. was president, devout Episcopal layperson, was periodically taking surveys of spiritual commitment of Americans. And what he would do is give a seven item questionnaire asking people whether they believe in God, whether they worship regularly, whether they pray daily, and so forth. Those who scored at the low extreme were half as likely to describe their lives as very happy as those who score at the high extreme of his spiritual commitment index. Uh, more recently, Gallup organization has been surveying a thousand people uh, a day, so approximately 350,000 randomly sampled Americans Here's data from those 350,000 for the year 2011. And what you see in the blue line is the average number of daily negative emotions reported by, vari by various Americans as a function of their frequency of religious engagement. And as you can see, those who were engaged at least once a week with a faith community were less likely to report negative emotions, and the green line much, much uh, more likely to report, or significantly at least more likely to report, positive emotions. The Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index aggregated data from 676,000 randomly sampled Americans over a two-year period, uh, 
and combine various measures into a global index of well-being. And as you can see, very religious people were more likely uh, to score, uh, they tended to score higher than, do, than did the non-religious and moderately religious. Uh, in 2010, Gallup surveys of 350,000 randomly, another 350,000 randomly sampled Americans led them to conclude that very religious Americans are doing very well. They have higher overall well-being, they lead healthier lives, they're less likely to have ever been diagnosed with depression. But you might wonder, is there flourishing a result of the religious faith or are people who are, uh, or, or is it the other way around, that maybe if you're a happy person, you're more likely to get out of the house and be religiously engaged than somebody who's depressed and isolated, for example. Uh, we got some insight into this by a famous study that's been going on in Germany now for more than 20 years, where, where 12,000 people have been followed over time. And when we followed these lives through time, one of the results has been that individuals who become more religious over that 20-year period then thereafter record long-term gains in life satisfaction, while those who become less religious subsequently record long-term losses in life satisfaction. Thus concluded the researchers, religious beliefs and activities can make a substantial difference to life satisfaction. That's happiness. Uh, let's look at health. Now, we know from the from, uh, field of behavioral medicine and work on, in health psychology that negative emotions can be toxic. Anger, depression, for example, tend to be associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, with diminished immune functioning, and thus with an increased rate of premature death. We also know that lack of social support predicts increased risk of ill health and premature death. People who are alone in the world tend to be less healthy than people that are well connected. Well, if religious involvement is conducive to positive emotions, as I just suggested to you with some of those data that it is, if it engages people in faith communities that provide social support, and if additionally it's conducive to healthier lifestyles, lower smoking rates, for example, then might we expect that religious engagement would be associated with better health, less immune suppression, fewer stress hormones, down the road, greater long, uh, longevity. Uh, and indeed, we now have several epidemiological studies that have tracked thousands of lives through years of time, and they all confirm that prediction. Here's, for example, one study that followed more than 5,000 Californians over 28 years. And what you find here, what you have here are data for men and for women. Gender differences are not important to us here at this moment. But you can see that not smoking gives you about a 40% reduction in the uh, rate of death over that period that people would otherwise experience. Likewise for those who are regularly exercising. And you get a similar effect of weekly religious attendance in terms of decreasing death rates over that time. Um, and there's other data, uh, which I'll show you in a, in a few moments. What about altruism, helping behaviors, generosity of time and money? We have a couple of contrasting worldviews here. One is that the universe has no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. There's no inherent meaning. Uh, and we have another idea that all people are God's children whom the Creator admonishes us to love with selfless compassion. Self-giving, self-transcending uh, behaviors are mandated by this idea. But that's just talk. Uh, the religious people actually walk that talk. There is lots of the talk. The 1993 World Parliament of Religions brought together people of different faith traditions around the world and they could all agree that every form of egoism, from our religious perspective, no matter what it is, should be rejected. We must treat others as we wish to treat ourselves. We consider humankind our family. The golden rule has its counterpart in other religious traditions as well. And we sing, my faith community, at Eastertide, uh, a, a Tazay chant, for example, compelling us to live in charity 
live in charity, and then God will dwell in you. And by the way, ev evolutionary psychologists, many of whom are not people of faith at all, agree religion fosters morality, social cohesion, group survival. I don't believe in God, say many of these religious, uh, these evolutionary psychologists, but it's adaptive, it's functional, it's healthy, it's good that it exists. Uh, well, what's the evidence? We have evidence that actively religious people are much less often juvenile delinquents as teenagers. They're less likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. And in European studies across Jews, uh, Orthodox, Catholics, and Protestants, they, are, they express less hedonistic and self-oriented values. Or at least they talk, the compassion talk. Uh, are they, in fact, more compassionate with their money and with their time? We have data from some earlier Gallup surveys done for the organization in the United States that studies charitable giving and volunteerism that found that rates of charitable contributions were significantly higher among people who were actively religiously engaged on a weekly basis compared to those not engaged. Uh, likewise, in the United Kingdom, those who say that religion is very important give away more money than those who say religion is not very important. Uh, the percent who are reporting working among the poor, the infirm, or the elderly in their communities is dramatically higher, has been at least in the past, among those who scored as highly spiritually committed on that Gallup scale. And people wonder, well, is this just because they're volunteering in their own faith communities? And so it's kind of in-group altruism. Well, that's still giving beyond oneself one might suggest, but one Baylor University study used uh, uh, data generated by Gallup to, to look at the percentage of people who were doing community volunteering that was not related to their church. And even then, weekly religious attenders were more likely to be doing that outside their faith community. Robert Putnam, the great Harvard public policy researcher who's written Bowling Alone, has also written a more recent book, American Grace, on how religion is reshaping our public lives, and notes that religious Americans have been three times more likely from their national surveys to be involved in their community, in voluntary associations, attending public meetings, donating time and money. And he thinks from his data that the link is causal, that non-attenders once they become religiously engaged, then tend to become more engaged in their communities as well. And the same kind of finding has come from the European Values Survey of 117,000 people, from which it was reported that people who attend church twice a week are more than five times more likely to volunteer than people who never darken the door of a worshiping community. But the biggest data, the most amazing data archive social science data archive in the world is now uh, available. And in fact, I was just accessing it on wireless on the plane uh, flying up from Minneapolis today to add a bit of data into this presentation. Comes from the Gallup World Survey. I don't understand the economics of how Gallup does this, but they have surveyed the planet Earth. Uh, uh, 2,000 or more people f across 140 countries, more recently it's been up to over 150 countries. One of the questions they asked in the Gallup World Survey was, have you done any of the following in the last month? Have you donated to a charity in the last month? And this is the percentage who answered yes. Among those who were less religious in Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Asia, and this is the percentage among those who were highly religious. Now, you appropriately want to know how are those terms defined? Highly religious were those who answered yes when asked, is religion important in your daily life, and who attended a religious service in the last week. Less religious was everybody else. Uh, okay, that's about a 50% difference. Uh, and by the way, you may wonder, well, are these folks giving away more money because they have more money to give away? And the answer is quite the opposite. They're poorer. The, aver the an average annual income converted to dollars or British pounds, as I've done, is uh, dramatically lower among the highly religious than among the less religious, which caused Gallup researchers to conclude that the data presented here offer compelling evidence of the role of religious dedication in helping to encourage supportive community-oriented behaviors. Uh, what about volunteering time to an organization? Again, 
from humankind across the world, we see about 17 to 20 percent say they have volunteered time to an organization in the last month, among those less religious, but something like 25 to 30 percent among those highly religious. Uh, okay, those are massive data, survey data. We also have experimental data. Uh, the first, the series of what are called priming experiments involving priming of religious images was done in Canada at the University of British Columbia. And what this study did, now replicated in other countries, is invite people first to unscramble sentences which for some people happen to include certain religion related words like spirit, divine God, and so forth. And then later, after this experience, they were given a choice as to how many $1 coins they were going to keep for themselves versus give to their lab, to their partner in this experiment. Those who'd been primed with these religious concepts were doubly generous in what they gave away as opposed to kept for themselves. And that's been replicated now. And so you can understand why Voltaire, a thoroughgoing skeptic, would say, I don't believe in God, but I want my attorney, my tailor, my servants, even my wife to believe in God so that I shall be robbed and cuckolded less often. I want the people around me to be religious uh, because it's going to benefit me. Uh, so the bottom line so far, and if you're a faith community, you're kind of smiling. Hey, we're kind of cool here, uh, is that Religion, is religion toxic? Is it dangerous? Is it one of the world's great evils? Really? Actually, we have massive data from huge data archives that religious engagement is a predictor of happiness, health, and helping. Okay, that makes us feel good. But there's another finding that may not make you feel so good. And as was said earlier tonight, in the spirit of freedom and courage, we gotta confront all the data. It's God's world. It's, let's see what it is. And these data are uh, kind of crisply summarized by this byline to a recent Chronicle of Higher Education article on the virtues of godlessness, noting that the least religious nations are the healthiest and most successful. And indeed, that is true. Secular places, states, countries, I don't know it's true of the provinces here in Canada, but I would guess it's true. It's true elsewhere, are great places to live. Uh, and in fact, if, we were, if I were to summarize, I'm gonna, I'm gonna present rapidly now a whole bunch of data, and that you're just gonna get bleary-eyed, but they're all showing exactly the same thing. So it's really quite simple. So I'm gonna tell you in advance what you're about to see, because it's really very simple. First, you're gonna see lots of examples powerful examples of the fact that as the religiosity of a country or of a state increases, good things decrease. Bad things happen in religious places, okay? Sorry, but that's just the real world and the skeptics are right here. But the other side of the coin is, and this is weird, the more religious individuals are, the more they experience good things. I call this the religious engagement paradox because the conclusions one draws from data at the aggregate level comparing places and groups drive us to a different conclusion than when we compare more versus less in, uh, religious individuals. Okay? Uh, and see if you can sort this out and think this through uh, with me. Uh, so uh, again, I call it the religious engagement paradox because what we're gonna see is that religious engagement correlates negatively with human flourishing, with well-being, with happiness, with health, with crime, you name it, across places, and positively across individuals. Thus, irreligious places and religious individuals tend to be flourishing, doing well. Now that's kinda weird, isn't it? Uh, and indeed, people in religious countries and states they're less satisfied with their lives, they die sooner, they smoke more, they commit more crime, they have more team births. I could just make that list go on and on. Let's start with the biggest data archive, the whole planet Earth. One of the questions that Gallup asked, as I mentioned a moment ago, in the Gallup World Poll is this. Is religion important in your daily life? Yes or no? For an article that was in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology about it, 
year or so ago, Ed Diener at the University of Illinois, and his then graduate student, Louis Tay, and I aggregated data, it was Louis that did the actual data aggregation, to give us an answer to that question from all humanity. It's the first time in the social sciences that I've ever seen a kind of human-wide result. And the answer for uh, the planet Earth, because these data, by the way, came from almost every country on Earth. Uh, what percentage of people on the planet Earth do you think say religion is important in their daily life? Want to make a guess in your heads? The answer turns out to be 68%. Now, it's a sampling thing. It's just one species on one planet. I mean, we can't generalize uh, to elsewhere in the cosmos, but <laughs> this, uh, this is our species. Uh, okay, Gallup asked another question. And it's a classic question in the study of kind of positive psychology and human well-being. It's called the ladder of life question. Imagine a ladder where zero, the bottom rung, is the worst life you can imagine, and 10, the top rung, is the best life you can imagine. Where is your life today on that 10-rung ladder? Again, that's a question you might want to answer in your own head. Well, here are data which I, uh, got from the, from the publicly available Gallup archive, which by the way, I can point you to if any of you want to play with any of these data, from 152 countries. Each of those blue dots is a country. Ranging from Denmark in the upper left, the happiest place on earth, where only 20% of people say religion is important in their daily lives, to Togo in West Africa, the most miserable place on earth, where 80% of people say religion is important in their daily life. My country, the United States, is right at the world average in religiosity, but above average in terms of uh, quality, self-rated quality of life. Uh, Canada, 44% rate the uh, religion is important in their daily life, and it's one of the happiest countries on earth, uh, but more secular than the average country on earth. Uh, you're looking, by the way, at a minus 0.52 correlation between the religiosity of a country and the self-reported well-being of its people. That's a substantial negative correlation. Uh, however, one thing we noted in that Journal of Personality and Social Psychology article is that that negative correlation disappears when we control for life circumstances, such as income. Remember I told you earlier that lower income people tend to be more religious? Well, back up a moment here. When we compare more and less religious countries, we're also comparing less and more, you know, countries with less and more income and education and so forth. There's confounded variables there. We're not just comparing religion, we're comparing rich places and poor places. And so if we control for income, if we statistically take that out, then we find that that negative correlation goes to zero or even turns and goes slightly positive. Uh, moreover, Think about this. Now we get into the paradoxical finding. When we look within countries, we find and we compare across individuals, we find a different result. Uh, for example, in Uganda and Ethiopia, this is the percentage of people who reported experiencing a lot of enjoyment during the day yesterday among those for whom religion is important in their daily life, and this is for those among whom, for whom religion is not important in their daily life. Religious people, religious individuals in both those countries are happier. And this is especially true, by the way, this finding in the relatively religious countries. Ed Diener, uh, in correspondence we had, noted that uh, just as a summary, across nations there's a negative correlation between national religiosity and life satisfaction, but that negative correlation goes away when you control for income. Across individuals within most countries, especially the more religious countries, religious individuals have higher life satisfaction. Uh, we can see the same paradox when we compare religious and irreligious states and individuals within the United States. So for example, Gallup gives us an index to emotional well-being in each of people in each of the 50 states of the United States. Because they have this, remember, this massive data archive, you know, 650,000 people over a two-year period. We also have data on the religious attendance rates of people in every state in the United States. And so we can correlate those two scores. It's very simple. 
I mean, this is like, this is like intro to psych level arithmetic here. And we see that in fact there's a negative correlation, although it's a modest negative correlation. The people in the most religious states tend to have the lower well-being. And yet, when we compare the percentage of people who say they're very happy as a function of religious attendance from never attend to attend several times weekly, we see that the percentage of very happy people is dramatically higher among those who attend several times weekly, or at least weekly, than it is among those who never attend. Okay, so there we see a positive correlation between religiosity and well-being. Across states, it's a negative correlation. Um, try another one, life expectancy. Here we get a more dramatic negative correlation between the religiosity of a state and the life expectancy of its people. People in highly religious states of the United States die sooner than people in secular irreligious states, and by a rather significant margin. And yet, when we look at life expectancy from these another one of the epidemiological studies as a function of religious attendance, we see a dramatic positive correlation between life expectancy and religious engagement. That, by the way, seven and a half year difference is about what you'd get if you compared uh, smokers and non-smokers. And in fact, part of that difference is due to the fact, as we'll see in a moment, that these people smoke more than these people. But that's, not, that's, only, <laughs> that's only about half the explanation. Uh, so, uh, what about smoking? Uh, here's the correlation between uh, religious attendance rates and smoking. Here, by the way, Mormon Utah is an outlier. Uh, <laughs> but, but otherwise, the, the data are pretty orderly. And the more ch people go to church in the state, the more they smoke. Uh, and by the way, here's data for states of the West Coast and states of the, of the American South. So we have religious adherence on this axis. And as you can see, the states of the South are all more religious than are the states of the West Coast. And now on the vertical axis, we have smoking rate. So we can see that on the West Coast, in every state, people smoke less than they do in every state of the more religious South. Okay? Religiosity of a place predicts high smoking rates. Your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit, so kill it with cigarettes. Uh, and yet, when we look across individuals in the United States, we see exactly the opposite, and dramatically so. People who are religiously active smoke much less than people who are irreligious. Uh, I think I'm about done here, but let's try crime rate. Uh, you want to be, you want to be at risk? Go live in a highly religious state. Uh, you're more likely to be victimized by crime than you are in a secular state. Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, highly religious states and dangerous places to live. Oregon, Washington, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, secular states and safe places to live. As a matter of fact, if we were to sum all this up, if we were to say, if right now tonight God was to pluck you out of this room and put you down in some other state or country and you wanted it to be a place where you would enjoy long life, you know, uh, happiness, health, you know, f f uh, name any good thing. Pray to God that it will be a secular, irreligious place uh, and that you will be a very religiously devout individual. <laughs> uh, and indeed, we can see, by the way, this state difference in crime rates. Again, all the West Coast states have lower crime rates than every one of the more religious uh, southern states. And yet, when we compare individuals, we see that actively religious individuals have a dramatically, not just a slightly, a hugely lower arrest rate than do people who are irreligious in the United States. Uh, by the way, I have recently stumbled across the same paradoxical result uh, having to do with politics and wealth. Down in the states, you understand that Mitt Romney was a Republican. Barack Obama is a Democrat. Who's Republican? Do rich people, are they more likely to vote Republican or Democrat? Answer that in your head. Well, let me show you some data. First of all, we see that low-income states vote more Republican than high-income states. 
So poor people vote Republican, or poor states vote Republican, rich states are more likely to vote Democrat. But when we compare individuals, we see exactly the opposite. Rich people, individuals, are more likely to vote for Mitt Romney and vote Republican. Poor individuals are more likely to vote Democrat. So we've had the religious engagement paradox. This is a parallel wealth and politics paradox. Poor states and rich individuals vote Republican. Crazy, huh? Okay, so what have I said? Uh, religion, I, I told Bill I was going to take 65 minutes, but I've talked so fast, I've actually taken less time than, than, than you paid for. You get a refund here, get, or, or, or we have more time to talk. Uh, religion, first of all, historically has had both perverse and beneficial associations. Secondly, we've seen that irreligious countries and states are flourishing places. Now, when we control for income and education, because those are also varying across those places, then that correlation, that negative correlation goes away. We've also seen that across individuals, religiosity correlates with good things. Happiness, health, altruism, civility, and other things I haven't shown you. Marital pregnancy, freedom from teen pregnancy, for example. And therefore, uh, says evolutionary biologist and fellow atheist David Sloan Wilson, who's aware of some of these data, we can conclude that Dawkins' diatribe against religion, however well-intentioned as a fellow atheist, is deeply misinformed. By the way, I think, but I'll be interested in your opinion, that the most important story is told at the level of the individuals, because that's where life is lived. That's where the rubber meets the road. And individuals are, who are highly religious tend to be more flourishing despite having lower income. So it's even, the, the finding even becomes more powerful when considered in those terms. And you don't have to be a religious person to at least acknowledge these data. One uh, recent book is entitled, An Atheist Defends Religion, Why Humanity's Better Off with Religion Than Without It. I can't believe in God, but I'm glad, glad religion exists. It sometimes does great harm, it sometimes is toxic, but on balance, it does more good in the world than evil. That doesn't mean it's true, by the way, but it does mean that the argument that it's dangerous and toxic is misplaced. So if religion is more conducive to health and well-being and to altruism, why is it? What does faith offer? As social scientists, I can't resist unpacking this very a little bit. And here are some of the things that people in my discipline have thought. First of all, social support is huge. It's probably, roughly speaking, half the effect that we've been looking at. Social support is a predictor of health and well-being. There are some 350,000 local faith communities in the United States and Canada, each of which is a social support network for their actively engaged people. They're folks who were there for one another when crunch time comes in their lives, as maybe you or your family has experienced or others you know. Second. Religious faith is associated with what we call self-regulation, or impulse control. A recent uh, article in the uh, biggest review journal in psychological science, Psychological Bulletin, noted that religious engagement is associated with a lot of the positive things we've just been talking about tonight. Decreased rates of time, crime, decreased teen pregnancy, decreased vulnerability to drug abuse, increased rates of exercise, longevity, marital satisfaction, succeeding in school, and so forth. Guess what, he notes, self-control, measures of self-regulation and impulse control are correlated with all those things in exactly the same way. And the reason that religion is associated with those things is that religion is conducive to impulse control and self-regulation. So, Michael McCullough and his co-author theorize. Also, Dorothy and I were talking a little bit about meaning and new research that's being done on meaning and spirituality. People who have a strong sense of purpose in life and meaning, something worth living and dying for, live with a greater sense of well-being than those who have a sense of meaningless, purposelessness to life. And for many people in the world, their religious faith helps define their sense of meaning. I referred earlier to this idea of grace. The good news that no matter what, uh, you are ultimately, profoundly, deeply accepted by God 
by what is ultimate in this universe, just as you are. If you believe that, might that pay some emotional dividends for you? Uh, we also have a whole new field of psychological science, studies on what's called terror management, terror management, how people react when confronted with reminders of their own mortality. Uh, and, uh, and oh, actually, that, that was my, 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 my last point here. Uh, and there is, you know, intrinsic, kind of central to Christian faith, the Easter hope in response to that terror, that terrible idea, that awareness of our own death. The idea that in the end, the very end, all should be well, and all should be well, and all manner of things should be well. If you embrace that Easter hope, does that help you Live with challenges, difficulties, stresses, defeats, failures in the interim. Uh, these are some of the ideas that have been proposed to explain the consistent and, and rather significant correlations across individuals between religious engagement and psychological well-being. I wrote a little book that's entitled A Friendly Letter to Skeptics and Atheists, and uh, I conclude by noting that between the extremes in our culture, of purposeless scientism on the one hand and a kind of mindless science denying fundamentalism on the other hand, there is a third alternative, which is a spirituality of humility. This takes us back to the beginning here tonight. That is rooted in a faith tradition across the centuries that is ever reforming, acknowledging it might be wrong, it's not defensive, it's welcoming scientific insights, it's welcoming natural revelation and biblical revelation, and trying to bring those two into conversation, and that at its best helps people make sense of the universe, gives meaning, opens us to the transcendent, connects us in communities, mandates morality and selflessness, and offers hope in the face of adversity and death. Uh, and so my final paragraph in this little book is, surely, in some ways, I'm wrong. You're wrong, we're all wrong. We glimpse ultimate reality as in a dim mirror constrained by our cognitive limits. Perhaps then we can draw wisdom from both skepticism and spirituality by anchoring our lives in a rationality and humility that restrains spirituality with critical analysis, that welcomes and embraces and participates in scientific inquiry, and on the other hand, in a spirituality that nurtures purpose, love, joy, hope. That, I sense, was the spirit of Concordia University that was articulated in that beautiful mission statement at the beginning tonight. Well, if you ever want to correspond with me or read any more about you know, kind of any of these lines of inquiry or anything else I've been into, you're welcome to visit my website, which is just davidmyers.org. 